Turn with me in the Bible to Proverbs chapter number 27. While you're turning to Proverbs chapter number 27, I know that many of you have asked me uh, different occasions about uh, Brother Gary Boltikoff. Of course, he's been up in Kansas for quite a while. And I understand that Brother Gary is supposed to come back to Austin this coming Tuesday. Uh, so if he does, why... Uh, I have no doubt that he'll be here Wednesday night to church. He's got that kind of a reputation that precedes him. And uh, so you might be praying for his safety as he travels. And then I understand that he is planning to uh, move to Kansas permanently. Um, There's uh, sometimes nothing you can do about a fellow but just pray for him uh, leaving Texas. But uh, hey, it's a, a free country. Uh, they got some good folks up there in Kansas too. There's no doubt about that. I hope you'll be praying for Brother Gary. Uh, we'll obviously use him in song leading and singing and so on and so forth uh, as long as he is around here. And I trust that you'll remember him in your prayers. I want to bring a message from Proverbs chapter number 27, please. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2 to get into my message. The Bible says there, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. I want to read verse number 2 also, even though you may think it's disconnected, I do not feel that it is. Verse number 2 says, Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. And I read that and put it with verse number 1, because of that first word of verse number 1. We have here some observations to make, and one of them is a contrast, because uh, the probably first thought that comes to most people's minds in this passage is uh, tomorrow. Thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. All we have is today. Uh, Yesterday is gone. Water under the bridge cannot be retrieved. Uh, tomorrow, uh, well, it says boast not about tomorrow because you don't know what the day is going to bring forth. And yet, on the other hand, by way of contrast, I can't help but notice Proverbs chapter number 6 where I'd like to begin reading in verse number 6. And there the Bible says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. Why? Because she's preparing ahead of time, right? Now, I just read, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. And now here I find this statement of, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Uh, kind of in the vein of, You better pay attention to what you're doing, and you better make some preparations for the future. Uh, here we have this industrious ant which does not have a boss and yet it has the good sense to make hay while the sun is shining. And it's kind of a little different uh, thought than boast not thyself of tomorrow for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Now there's a kindred New Testament passage to this. If you look at Romans chapter number 15, 
and verse number 24, we're going to learn a little bit about the Apostle Paul planning for the future likewise. And I think we would all agree that the Apostle Paul was a wonderful servant of the Lord, and yet he prepared or made plans for what would be on the morrow. Kind of a contrast to 27.1 of the book of Proverbs. In Romans chapter number 15 and verse number 24, I'll give you a little bit of background. Paul seems to, in his life, have had the continual desire to go and preach the gospel in Rome. In fact, he book, wrote this book of Romans and tells them of his desire to come unto them. Now, in chapter number 15 and verse 24, he says this, Whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way thitherward by you. If first I be somewhat filled with your company. Now down in verse number 28, we have the same essential thought given to us. And that thought being that he is making plans. He's not just idling away the time. He is somewhat um, being visionary in his process here. He is looking to the future and planning about the future. Now verse number 28, we have, When therefore I have performed this, uh, that he's got his mind on right then, and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. Now it looks to me like these two verses are telling us that the Apostle Paul is planning ahead, methodically lining out what he wants to do, uh, what he feels he ought to be doing. In other words, it looks to me like he's not only living today, but he is planning for tomorrow or thinking of the future. As I think about the Apostle Paul and his future, I think to myself, that the Apostle Paul was not only one who planned for the future, but like the ant in Proverbs chapter number 6, he was industrious and diligent, very conscientious in his labor for the Lord. The Apostle Paul was no slouch. He was not one to loaf. He was not one to take advantage of a situation. The Apostle Paul was one to be out there on the front lines doing what he could for the Lord. For instance, in this vein, the Bible teaches a work ethic. I just want to make comment on the side about this. I think that many times that has been lost in our country today. By that I mean the historic Judeo-Christian work ethic. Now, the Apostle Paul said this in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, For even when we were with you, this we commanded, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Uh, an interesting thing to put forth. And it not only has the idea involved with it about working and eating, but it has the idea involved with it also, I think, of working and then eating or planning ahead. It's kind of like Marcia down here will try to plan ahead on the meals that she's going to be uh, cooking along the way. Uh, we have to plan ahead. Now, I'm not 
circumventing Proverbs 27.1 and I want to get back to it in a minute but I do want to try to point out that one is certainly within the bounds of uh, biblical truth to consider the future and to have a good work ethic toward that. The mapping out of a plan, the laying out of a plan. I used to have a professor in school, um, in the seminary that taught the fellows, uh, plan your work and work your plan. Ah, not a bad idea to follow. Now, sometimes it doesn't work out. Sometimes things come up and you have to be bendable, as it were, or you'll break. But be that as it may, we have a thought process going on here of, on the one hand, you've only got today, but yet on the other hand, you're wise to plan for tomorrow. And to work, have that work ethic involved in it. Now, that work ethic also shows up in Proverbs chapter number 20 and verse number 4, where it is brought out a little bit more clearly concerning the working and then the enjoying later the fruits of one's work. In Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number 4, the Bible says the sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg in harvest and have nothing. Now, obviously that has the tone to it of you better keep your mind on what you're doing. You better keep in mind that while you can, you need to lay plans for the future. You need to work while you can because that day is going to come when you're going to want to enjoy the fruits of your work and the fruits of your plan. And in this, I note that the Apostle Paul, even a minister of God, worked and labored. Of course, we know that Paul was a tent maker by trade and that Paul made tents many times in the ministry. We were talking a little bit earlier about working and the ministry uh, and so on. Well, uh, hey, if it wasn't uh, too good for the Apostle Paul, it ought not to be too good for me. And Paul made tents in the ministry. But not only that, even in his church work, I think Paul was very diligent. He was no slouch. He was not one to take advantage, nor was he a clock watcher. And I think he loved the Lord and he wanted to serve the Lord. For instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 and verse number 10, I'd like to read more scriptures than I'm giving, but I'm trying to watch the clock a little bit too uh, for the benefit of everyone concerned. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 10, Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Now you might want to underline that phrase because that's true of every one of us. And he goes on to say, And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. Giving kind of an idea, is it possible for God to have bestowed his grace upon some of us and we turned it out to nothing? You know, listen folks, we're debtors to the Lord. There wouldn't be anything left of any of us if it weren't for the grace of God and His mercy and His kindly helping us nut bells out. 
we are fortunate to be around the grace of God. And Paul says, His grace was bestowed upon me, not in vain. I want to ask you the question. Those of you who are here and you're saved today. Now, if you're not saved, I'd like to suggest His grace is still being bestowed upon you. And I hope it won't be in vain. But Paul, as a Christian, as a child of God, says, His grace was not bestowed upon me in vain. Why? Note the next part of the verse. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Now if you'll read the context of that phrase, you'll find out that Paul is talking about the other apostles and other Christians. And uh, boy, listen, he didn't want to be counted as a freeloader in the Lord's work. He wanted to be a cylinder in the engine, not a brake shoe on the wheel. Paul wanted to give, am I safe in saying this? Paul wanted to give more than he took. Now I like that attitude in a person, uh, that they want to be worth more uh, than is on the surface. Uh, I believe that it is important for a Christian especially to have that attitude because of a testimony that they need to maintain before a lost world. Now the apostle said, uh, keep in mind he's thinking about tomorrow. Keep in mind he has that work ethic and he says, I labored more abundantly than they all. And then he is quick to add, just table this, but look at it. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And that's another phrase that I think you need to underline in your Bible. Now, again in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 and verse 23, and again, I wish I had the time to read more verses around this, but I'll just read verse number 23 for our purposes this morning. The Apostle Paul says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. And when he says that, I, I think he's saying, I'm, I'm going to be telling you some things about myself. And uh, it's going to seem... Uh, like I'm bragging, it's going to seem like uh, I'm uh, uh, putting forth myself. Uh, he said that would be speaking as a fool. That's kind of what is going on in that parenthetical statement, I speak as a fool. Uh, in other words, uh, Paul was not one to brag on himself, yet he was one uh, to put forth the facts of the situation. Along those lines, you guys here, I know most of you are young enough you never heard the name, but I'm going to use it anyway. Anybody here ever heard the name of Dizzy Dean? Ah, I have a friend, Dizzy Dean. Dizzy Dean, what, what was he? I can't remember what was. Baseball uh, commentator or something like that. Dizzy Dean said, if you done it, it ain't bragging. So I, I, I always thought that was a good statement, but it needs to be uh, cared for likewise. Well, anyway, Paul is saying, uh, listen, I want to tell you some things that you need to think about. And he says, I know uh, that one bragging on himself or, or this, I'm not trying to brag, I'm just trying to bring forth the truth. He says, uh, this would be foolish for me to brag on myself. Paul bragged on the Lord. That's what Paul did. He constantly said, Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now here in this verse of... Verse 23 of 2 Corinthians, he says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more... In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, 
in prisons more frequent and deaths off. I, I wanted to read the rest of that verse just to point this out, if I may, brothers and sisters. The Apostle Paul sacrificed in order to serve the Lord. Now we're living in a time zone when I fear that many Christians don't have very much backbone in them. It's mostly jelly. And I'm afraid that in this day that we live in, there aren't too many people who are willing to sacrifice. Notice I said willing, not wanting. I don't want to sacrifice. I'll be honest with you. I've never looked for an opportunity to sacrifice for the Lord. I'm not going to take a whip and flog my back with it or anything like that. Whatever. And yet, on the other hand, I think that God's people need to be willing to sacrifice for the Lord if need be. Oh, by the way, that, that's kind of a loaded statement I made. Because in one way, you cannot sacrifice for the Lord. God is not going to be any man's debtor. And we talk about the sacrifices we make for the Lord a little on the light side. i got to tell you this. Uh, we got far more when we got saved than no amount of sacrifice that we could possibly do. Right? We need to understand that and realize that. Now the Apostle Paul planned for the future. He labored because you can plan all you want to, but you've got to get with the plan ultimately. He labored and he was willing to sacrifice for it. And I think it's kind of like, oh, uh, I often have thought on a secular basis that many young people in our day and age want to start out financially at a spot that it took their parents 30 years to get to. And I think that many young people want to start out serving the Lord in what they see in many ministers that it took them 30 years to get to. I remember the day when I was a boy where when a person surrendered to the Lord, he didn't surrender to the Lord and tell the Lord what he was surrendering to. He just surrendered to the Lord. And whatever the Lord brought up, that's what he was willing to do. Now I fear that there are many young people that look at many seasoned what the world would call successful ministry. Well, now wait. Yay, uh, even in, in uh, Christian circles, what we would honestly call successful ministers, and they want to surrender to be like that. Well, that may not be your lot. I've known a lot of men out here, good men, uh, better men than I'll probably ever turn out to be, good men who labored and sacrificed all their lives and it seemed like they never got very far in the work of the Lord. But you want to remember, the Bible says, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Just keep that in mind. Now the Apostle Paul was one who didn't want to start out where Peter started out. In fact, he even used the phraseology that he did not want to build on another man's foundation. In short, the Apostle Paul was one to plan and the Apostle Paul was one to work for the Lord. Now, that may seem a little bit somewhat odd to you guys in the light of Romans, or pardon me, Proverbs chapter number 27. But the two sides of the coin are indeed in the Bible. So what's the deal? Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways. Or in Proverbs chapter number 20, uh, be wise. 
because the sluggard won't plow by reason of the cold and therefore he's going to beg and harvest and have nothing. Well, what is the deal? What is going on? I think that James chapter number 4 and verses 13 and following hold the key to this thought. So, turn with me to James chapter number 4 and I'm going to begin my reading in verse number 13. I think this pretty well sums it up. Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. So to me, I think we have the key here brought to our attention. We need to understand it is right for us to realize that we only have today, really. None of us know what's going to happen. We have today. Yet it is also right and proper that we understand the need for planning and preparing and working for tomorrow also. What's the key to it being in balance? If the Lord will. Now let me make a remark about that for just a moment. That's got to be real. I think a lot of people use that phrase, Lord willing, and that's the end of their thought process to it. It's got to be real. I think we should come to realize and understand that every breath we take is by the grace of God. We need to realize and understand that God is the one who controls our life. And we are definitely dependent upon His action, being proactive in our lives, as it were. We don't know the trouble He keeps us out of. We don't know the near-death experiences He's saved us from. I know yesterday, Marsh and I were going north on um, Bessop uh, Cameron over here. And up there at Parmer and Dessau, there was a, what looked to me to be a terrible accident. And it looked to me like somebody hadn't slowed down at the red light and they plowed into the rear end of a car in front of them. It looked like a terrible accident. When something like that comes along, I can't even look around to see because I don't like to... I'm not a strong stomach person. Uh, so I, I can't do it. But I thought to myself, there somebody was on their way to do something, but their plan was changed just all of a sudden. Now here, the Bible says, You know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is just a vapor a vapor that appeareth but for a moment and then vanisheth away. And I think really that what the deal needs to be spoken of is in that first word of Proverbs 27.1, boast. And pride, which is all too prevalent in our society, and I wrote in my notes, there are too many, quote, eyes, unquote, in our speech. I know that there have been journalists who have studied speeches by the administration and counted the number of eyes 
in the speeches. Maybe you guys have read some of the same articles that I have. We need to realize that with the Apostle Paul, he said, Not I, but Christ liveth in me. Boast not thyself, because you don't know what a day may bring forth. Shakespeare put it this way, Life is but a fool that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. James, I just read it from chapter number 4 and verse number 14, Life is but a vapor. In James chapter number 1 and verse number 10, it's likened unto the flower of the grass that today is and tomorrow is gone. In Matthew chapter number 6, to which I'm going to invite your attention, please, if you'll turn to Matthew chapter number 6, I want to read verses 28 through 34. Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Which I think what we're getting here is a putting of stuff into proper perspective. Your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will take care of themselves. Now I know that's Burkholderized, uh, and I'm not trying to make a new version. Uh, you guys know how I feel about the version of the Bible. Uh, but here we have it. All these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So, it is right that we keep stuff, I think, in proper balance, in proper perspective. Along those lines, then, I would like to say that there are two areas of consideration. One is in regards to the life of the believer, the Christian, and the other one is in the life of the unsaved or those who are outside the household of faith. In this area, I want to talk just briefly about those who know the Lord as their Savior. And I think that it is important that those who know the Lord as their Savior consider these verses redeeming the time because the days are evil Ephesians 5.16 and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed the night is far spent the day is at hand let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light and then Jesus statement in John 9 4 work for the night cometh when no man can work. In other words, I'm saying that if you're here today and you're saved, you really need to be serving the Lord while you can. And you say, well, Brother Burkholder, it sounds like you're just using today right now. Well, now hold the phone just a minute. There's another thought that I'm not going to have time to bring out. But I will, I mean, I'll bring the thought out. You guys will have to put the meat on the bones for it. And it is just this. We're going to stand before our Savior one of these days. And when we do stand before the Lord, I think you will have been wise to have done some preparation. Now, I, salvation, yes. I'm going to get to that in just a moment. But what about the child of God? 
I've heard Christians say, just as long as I get into heaven, that's all I care about. What? You mean you don't care anything about having some crowns to lay at the Savior's feet who died for you? What? You mean you don't love the Lord enough to want to be able to do something to honor His glorious name? I think that Christians need to wake up. Knowing the time, it's high time to wake up and go to work for the Lord and plan ahead because we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give account of the things done in the Bible. Right? That's what it says. And for the child of God, if you're here and you're saved today, you, you've been to the cleansing fountain, as it were. You've received the Lord as your Savior. You know that you have Jesus in your heart. You know you're going to heaven when you die. You need to be serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, well, Brother Burkholder, you're trying to order us what to do. I'm just trying to tell you what the Bible orders you to do. I fear that too many Christians are way too lax when it comes to serving the Lord. I'm going to make a statement that I used in uh, Sunday school class before Doug came for the Bible lesson this morning. Uh, when we went to breakfast this morning, there was that thing going across the television, you know, that tells the news headlines and so on. And the guy from Hungary, Prime Minister, President, uh, Executor, whatever they call him over there, uh, said that the Europe continent was not going to be recognizable after a while because of Islamic immigration. And I couldn't help but look around me at the other people there receiving breakfast at the hotel. And I could not help but say to myself, Marsha and I are the only ones in here dressed, look like we're going to church. Did you happen to notice that, honey? I thought to myself, America is unrecognizable because most people have tabled their commitment to the Lord. And I couldn't help but notice a lot of little kiddos in there this morning especially. They're not growing up in Sunday school. They're not growing up learning the Bible stories about Nicodemus or Zacchaeus was a wee little man or Moses in the basket of bulrushes. They're not growing up learning the stories about David and the slingshot and the killing of Goliath. They're not learning about the salvation available in Jesus Christ our Lord. Our nation has turned into a mission field itself. I hate to say this and many of you are probably going to disagree with me on this. Um, it, it's it's all right. I've been disagreed with so much it doesn't even faze me anymore. Our nation is turning into a heathen nation. Now, I'm not going to blame that on the heathen. You know what I think? God doesn't ask the heathen to serve him. But he does ask his people to serve him. And I think it is right that God's people think ahead just a little bit. Don't boast about tomorrow. Stop saying, I'll do it when I get around to it. Stop saying, I'm going to go back to church when I can. Stop saying, I'm going to, and get with it. But I will say this. We need to understand that we have a little window of time here on earth to serve the Lord. And brothers and sisters, I am afraid that all over out there, there are people who call themselves Christians, many of whom I hope are even saved. What do you want me to hope they're not saved? No, I, I, I don't hope that at all. But they're out on the lake today or they're out at a football game.
Day or they're doing this or they're doing that. The Lord's Day, I mean, if you look at our country, could you tell Sunday is the Lord's Day? Is there enough evidence? In short, God's people need to get with it. But I want to go to this area also. In the book of Luke, chapter number 12, and you remember this well, the guy had a plentiful harvest, and he said, what am I going to do? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear my barns down and build bigger barns, and I'm going to stir all my goods away. And I'm going to say, take thy knees, thou hast much goods laid up for many days. Now keep in mind, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. And the Lord said unto him, Thou fool, this night shall thy soul be required of thee. This night. So live that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. If you're here today and you're saved, I hope you'll consider carefully the need to really serve the Lord. Don't compare yourself to the next guy and, well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Or don't, don't just judge yourself on what the next guy is or is not doing. Compare yourself to Jesus Christ. If you're here and you're saved, I, I hope you'll really consider that business about serving the Lord. I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. We're living in perilous times. And I think God's people are going to be brought to the situation where they realize it before it's all said and done. But then I want to switch just a moment to those who may be here and, and you don't know the Lord. Or perhaps you're here and you don't know whether you're saved or not. To me, one of the most foolish things, no, the most foolish thing in all the world is not to settle one's relationship to Jesus Christ as Savior. Because one split second... After you die, or after the Lord comes, is going to be one thing that matters. And that's whether you go to be with the Lord or destined to eternity in hell. I hope you'll consider and prepare for the future. Every one of you here have a future. Right? Come on. The soul is eternal. We've all got a future. Where are you going to spend that future? Jesus came and died on the cross of Calvary for your sin, for my sin, that we might have the forgiveness of sin. Just not the forgiveness, but the atonement for sin. It's a different thing, brothers and sisters. Jesus paved the way for us to become a child of God, redeemed, bought with the blood of Christ, saved, a child of God, born again, you can spend your future in heaven. Where will you spend your future? May we stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for the time we've had together this morning. I thank you, Lord God, for your word. I thank you that we have the joy and the privilege of looking into it and Oh, how thy Holy Spirit unfolds the 
precious truths, the jewel, the gold, and the silver that is in there, that hidden treasure of thy glorious word. And I pray, O Holy Spirit of God, that you'll open our understanding this very moment. For those who may be here not saved, I pray that this will be the day they're understanding is opened and they come to see their need of Christ and get saved today. And perhaps there are those here, Lord, who are saved but have a desire to break away from the average and to step out in faith to be more for Thee. I know not the need of each heart thou knowest, and I commit the people to thee, Lord, praying thy blessing upon them. And it is thy blessing, Lord, that wakes us out of our sleep and causes us to sober up and realize that we have this window of time. What we do with it does make a difference. So I pray, Holy Spirit of God, that Thou wouldst now exalt Christ as the Savior and Lord of life. And I pray that You might bless this people, each individual, to know and do what Thou wouldst have for them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Number 159 in the book, if you'd like to sing along.